through college death, the New Black Panther Party had national, well-defined operations in terms of the work that was being done, whether you being was held, being held accountable locally, regionally, or nationally. Uh, between Aaron Michaels and Khalid Muhammad, there was a pretty good strong grip on that because Khalid was a no-nonsense person, at least as it applies to the operation and in, 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 in the um, formation, so to speak, of how the, the chapters would operate. But after Khalid's death, to me, the organization kind of took a turn uh, downward just simply because it was all at, with, with Khalid's coming to the organization as a national chairman, you had literally you had a, a dozens of chapters that came online simply because they were following Khalid in his journey, his, his journey and his identity being reshaped and repurposed uh, now that he was out of the Nation of Islam officially. But at the same time, now that he was gone, since a lot of people left the, uh, the Nation of Islam to join Khalid under his plight under the new Black Panther Party, when Khalid's the, the unfortunate demise came about, you, you had people who basically joined simply because they wanted to follow Khalid as opposed to what we refer to again as the pre-Khalid era to where when people joined the new Black Panther Party, they, they never joined. I don't know of anybody that actually joined because it was led by Aaron Michaels. They joined because they believed in the purpose of, of, of doing work in the community. They joined because they believed in, in serving the people. If I asked you to get a piece of paper and something to write with, and to make a numerical list of all the things that you would be willing to die for. How long is your list? The Pat 48. Willing to die for. The Pat 48. Willing to die for. How long is your list? What is the tribal stuff? The Pat 48. The tribal stuff is what goes above the immediate Willing to die for How long is your list? So the connection with the is tied into the tribal self. What does that mean? That means that the tribal self willing to die for that he don't have the right How long is your to claim independence. Peace and power. This is your Panther 48. Starting out with your brother Syke calling out of Dallas, Texas. I got a uh, brother Wall with me, uh, chairman of the San Diego Black Panther Party, calling out of California. Shout out to people, everyone. And we have uh, brother E, uh, chairman of the Gordon Founders Black Panthers. <laughs> I'm, jo <laughs> I'm joking. I feel like being funny this Sunday. But uh, we got Brother E, our official Minister of Information of the Panther 48, calling out of Florida. Word. Anyway, today today's show, we're going to be dispelling the myths of the Panther 48. And the reason we decided to do this is because we've been getting a lot of... Uh, comments we, we're getting a lot of comments a lot of messages from people uh seeming like that they seem to be upset with us for having people on our show you know to us that'll be like being upset with i don't know who has a show nowadays here but i'm gonna go back i'm, I'm gonna date myself when i say this that'd be like being upset with arsenio hall for having particular people on his show or being upset with uh uh what's that dude name uh jerry springer for having certain people on his show you know, we we consider ourselves to kind of be a revolutionary media, and we attempt to find the truth from different people that move in these revolutionary arenas. But we're gonna start with Brother War, and sometimes the best way to understand what something is is to understand what it is not. And we're gonna start with Brother Up War by breaking down to us and the listening audience what the Panther Forty Eight is not. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep that plain and simple. But what I would basically say. The Panther 48 is not a Panther formation. And by saying uh, we are not a Panther Four Nation formation, what we basically mean by that is that this is not an active chapter, us three running a chapter collectively in terms of uh, doing community activism or operating under the banner of the Panther Party. But what what uh, make us the Panther 48 is that we all have our start um, in terms of certain levels of activism within the Panther Party. All three of us started uh, under the new Black Panther Party in Dallas, Texas, uh, pre uh, Khalid Muhammad. 
And to me, I have to say that pre Khalid Muhammad, and we can get into that later, that just kind of signifies the uh, the era in which we were members of the, the new Black Panther Party. Well, you you didn't open the door, so so we I guess we got to distinguish that. You say pre Khalid Muhammad. A lot of people don't know of the Panther Party or that that these uh, that the Panther Party had been reformed before Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad because he started spreading the chapters and making it more popular in the East Coast. So what was going on with the Panthers pre Khalid Muhammad? Well, I look at that when I think pre Khalid Muhammad, I, I, I kind of break it down into what I call three distinct um, time periods. You have when the, the, the Panther Party, uh, the New Black Panther Party were referred to as the men in black in Dallas. In their early days, we talking like 1988, 89, up until I would say basically 1990. Um, and then you have the second era to where the New Black Panther Party was actually uh, working collectively with um, Kwaku Duran on the West Coast under the uh, the uh, the Panther Vanguard. And so there was a merger between, a, a brief merger between the New Black Panther Party and the um, Black Panther Vanguard, which created the New Black Panther Party Vanguard. And, and, and from that, um, there was a, a pretty good relationship and the organization expanded under the new Black Panther Party through Avery Michaels as still again as a, the, uh, the, uh, the the national. And then what happened was the Khalid Muhammad and, and, and Aaron got together, and then that formed that other that that final um, division that I that I deal with that broke it down. And so when we say pre Khalid, we're talking about before Khalid Abdul Muhammad became the national chairman, who in essence was the first national chairman because prior to that. Aaron didn't necessarily identify himself as a national chair or national men's defense. It was really more or less us operating on the local autonomy, but doing, you know, works with other for, with other chapters and helping other new Black Panther Party chapters form and operate. But it was always about being accountable in, in your local your local area. So that 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 um, that element of what we refer to as local autonomy reigns supreme in that that element and what Aaron went around the nation doing is just helping people stay in a line still with the uh, Panther ideology. And at that point in time, it was a 14 point platform. So uh, prior to Khalid Abdul Muhammad coming on board, it was a 14 point platform. And then it uh, once he came aboard, we, uh, we went back to the, the essence of the 10 point platform. Okay, so what about after Khalid? What, what uh, distinguishes the new Black Panther Party? You know, you just said before, what about after Khalid? Well, when I think about after college, you have to think about what I really would consider to be the the real decline in terms of membership of the of the organization, as well as to the to, to some degree whether people agree with it or not, the substance of the New Black Panther Party. Because prior to college death, the New Black Panther Party had national, well-defined operations in terms of the work that was being done whether you being was held being held accountable locally regionally or nationally uh between Aaron Michaels and Kali Muhammad there was a pretty good strong grip on that because Kali was a no-nonsense person at least as it applies to the operation and in, 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 in the um, formation so to speak of how the, the chapters would operate but after college death to me the organization kind of took a turn uh downward just simply because it was all at with with college coming to the organization as a national chairman you had literally had a, a dozens of chapters that came online simply because they were following college in his journey his, his journey and his identity being reshaped and repurposed uh now that he was out of the nation of islam officially but at the same time now that he was gone since a lot of people left the uh, the nation of islam to join college out his plight under the new black panther party when college the, the uh, unfortunate demise came about, you you had people who basically joined simply because they wanted to follow college as opposed to what we refer to again as the pre-college era to where when people joined the new Black Panther Party, they, they never joined. I don't know of anybody that actually joined because it was led by Aaron Michaels. They joined because they believed in the purpose of, of, of doing work in the community. They joined because they believed in, in serving the people. But Khalid Muhammad was such a charismatic figure. When he came along, you literally had people join because Khalid Muhammad was at the helm. When that was no longer the case, we lost a significant amount of people in the formations because there was there was there was not this charismatic figure who would keep you motivated and keep you inspired to serve 
uh, under the banner or, or under or, or don the beret as a member of the black the new Black Panther Party. So when I think uh, post college, you, you you now talk about a, a spiral downward simply because now people were recognizing that they ne- they weren't necessarily aboard because they identified with the works of the of, of the Panther legacy, but more so they identified with individuals that that happen to be Panthers at this moment in time. And so I think the organization, the New Black Panther Party, has not re- fully at all recovered from that stigmatism and from and, and from still trying to work on figuring out what an identity and a purpose is as it applies to that. Of course, you have this doesn't say that all of the organ, all of the chapters are, are dealing with that same level of destruction or that same level of, of uh, decline. But what it basically means is from a national level, um, it, it made it a whole lot harder for people to come aboard uh, and, and for their chapters to get trained properly and be held accountable to, to uh, the, the proper standard to to get the work done and, and do the, and do what they're supposed to do. And let me say this, uh, uh, and just clarifying and tell me if I'm wrong or stop me. I just want to make it uh, uh, a, a quick clarification or uh, of what you just said for the listening audience. So basically, Pan- New Black Panther Party started in Dallas, in Dallas, Texas, under people like Aaron Michaels and David Borman and all the people that joined the New Black Panther Party and joined that formation joined because they believed in the work of the Panther Party and believed in the ideology of the Black Panther and, and believed that that ideology could basically make significant changes in the community. Then Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad joined the New Black Panther Party that already existed. And when he joined because of who he was, literally dozens of chapters popped up overnight because people followed Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. And that didn't necessarily mean that they had an understanding of Panther ideology. They just had an understanding of respect and a, and, a, and a deep faith and belief in Dr. Khalid himself. And they wanted to do whatever it is that he was doing. And essentially when he died, when, when he uh, uh, died, that left people in the chapter that, that basically didn't have a full, not all, but didn't a lot of them that didn't really have a full understanding of what Panther ideology was. So whatever organizations they came from, they essentially brought those ideologies into the Panther Party and it kind of turned the new Black Panther Party into something else. And as you said, it never it is never fully recovered from that yet. Yeah, and, and I look at that as also when college passed, what you ended up having is is what I refer to as the stage of, of, uh, of emulating. So a lot of the figures that attempted to continue to move the organization forward, whether it be on a national, regional, or local level, there was there was these people, there was uh, several people that was just basically emulating the the, the talk in, in in some of the walk of college, and by doing so, that was kind of their their way of, of trying to hold on to things and keep things and going and, and keep things in order, uh, and, and and working toward that. But to me, when you look at it from that standpoint. Uh, when I'm emulating someone or, I, or I'm, I'm emulating a process, then that's that's not that's not the real deal. That is basically me me winging it or me tr- attempting to try to figure something out in in the process of seeing if it's going to manifest uh, uh, out of this reality or into something more you know to, to more natural. So the organization went through some emulating emu, emulating stages as a result of of, of of college not being around and as a result of people being more or less what I refer to as being starstruck because of, of Khaled in terms of him being very charismatic and, and very energetic and very um, powerful in terms of how he brought how he brought the messages he brought to the organization. But one of the things also that came about uh, when when Khaled was in, in his um, uh, I want to say this was uh, probably maybe not even quite a year before he passed away was he took the information that had came out of Dallas um, by way of Hashim and Zynga, and and they they took a lot of the, the documents and, and writings and, and works, some of the abstract, they extract from the manual we was using in Dallas and formed the National Black Power Manual. And so from that, that was kind of more or less uh, Colin and Aaron going back and forth and, and realizing that we, we need to make have something in place as we grow the New Black Panther Party to make sure these other chapters are, have something, a basis to work from. So part of the stuff that we we went through in Dallas 
uh, got put into a manual. Khaled also um, took the 14 point platform and made it more more Afrocentric and and took and, and went back and pulled some things that the um, the third development Panthers were, were, were utilizing that we ne didn't necessarily utilize in Dallas. And he pulled these things together and he formed the Black Power Manual. And the idea before he had made made a transition was he was actually going in the process of going, going to set up a national uh, school in Atlanta, Georgia, that that uh, leadership would have to go through in order to be able to actually then go back and take to their cities and train and develop chapters. That's one of the discussions that we had actually had uh, at one point in time. But again, because of the way he is, his transition took place in the, the organization nationally not being prepared for it, it took on an emulation stage and a lot of the, the, the stuff that we were talking about, not, and it wasn't just me, but the people that he was, uh, that were privileged to having this discussion with him about establishing and setting up this national um, uh, training training headquarters in Atlanta, uh, that stuff fell by the wayside. And so it just became a lot of emulating and a lot of people trying to find their own wings and their own merits, whether it be locally, regionally, and nationally. So nationally to me, the organization definitely suffered and, and got and was a lot weaker because it leaned heavily from a national perspective on the identity of Khalid Muhammad. Whereas again, like places like Dallas, we we was we were around before Khalid. So from that standpoint, it didn't have that significant of an impact on our operation because we weren't established in college. So a lot of the chapters that had strong local leaders and were already, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the game, had skin in the game before college, did not suffer the same level of faith as chapters did that, that came along after college. So so let me ask this, uh, two questions, and then, we, then we're going to move on building about the Panther 48. I just think that people would, that would watch this would want to know some of these things. Uh, and I'm going to ask E, I'm going to put E in the conversation a little bit. I'm going to ask E this, and then I'm going to come back and ask you the, the second question. Uh, e, because you was there, you know, uh, I was out of the picture right after Dr. Khalid died, and we went to the funeral in uh, New York. Not long after that, I'd be out of the picture. But what did you see happen to the, the, the Panther chapters after Khalid's death, after we went and put him you know, in the ground, what did, did you see any significant changes in the way that the chapters was operating or the way that the Panther was moving? It was pretty much, it was pretty much what we were saying was gonna happen. You know, it caused the personality. They attempted to transform it into the nation of Islam with guns, um, things, Came more salam alaikum, less black power. I mean, in action, I mean, black power was the yell, but there was always the, the, the Islam thing in, in the background. And I mean, I, I I didn't stick around too awful long after you left. You know, war will know the dates better because, you know, I tell you, I, all that shit's a blur. I don't remember the dates and shit. I remember some of the stuff that went on, but. I really wasn't paying attention, so I don't remember. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it 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 absolutely did everything that we were afraid of it. Of afraid was going to happen when when the whole colleague coming on board thing uh, started to happen, or, or we as we saw it take place, we had discussions about this is going to happen. What's going to happen, y'all? And it, it it not what we want, and it wasn't what we wanted. Um, the focus turned from. You know, we always talked about uh, thinking globally and acting locally. It turned into everybody trying to be in the spotlight. Every other motherfucker that, that, that was chairman was trying to be a little college. You know, it, every motherfucker start doing like college and all his mannerisms and all that shit, whether they was from, you know, up north, you know what I'm talking about, or down south in Texas, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, uh, everybody was trying to be college. It was a cult of personality, like any you know political edu uh, political contest in this country or or anything else. It, it, it was people joining and being around because they like college talk, not because they wanted to do the work. And that was counter to everything that we were wanting to do. I Me mean, personally, I think we were perfectly happy with what we had before college came. 
because as small as as small as our actions were, as as almost meaningless at times, we were way more effective in dealing with the community and we're in a better position to embrace the opportunities that we had than we were after college. Because after college came, you know, it's that it's like anytime the spotlight is put on you, anytime you're elevated to a national level, you start dealing with national level shit. It's the same idea as behind what's that song? The more money I come across, the more problems I see, or the more notoriety we came across, the more problems we had. The more distracted we were by the bright lights, the more uh, folks were uh, uh, paranoid, the more arguments came to be, the more power struggles came to be. And there wasn't no power struggle before Kali came. Then all of a sudden it's a power struggle between him and, 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 and what you call it name, um, Aaron. You know, so it took away from everything that we wanted to do. You know, that star power is bullshit. You know, I would prefer it never happened. You know, and, you know, you know, I love pilot. I put on the best. I was the first one to jump up and say, give me the best with no gun. I'll take the bullet, fuck it. But I would much prefer for him to have stayed his path and been a friend of the party or, you know, black power homeboy or whatever type of situation and let the Dallas chapter just keep on being the Dallas chapter with all the issues that it had, with all of the, the you know, drama that it had, we still had way more possibilities to be effective than after Kyle came. Hmm. Now, Ward, the question I wanted to ask you, Ward, and then we're going to build on this, uh, we're going to continue building, but the question I want to ask you is, okay, Kyle passed, that was the first national chairman of the, of the, uh, of the New Black Panther Party, because as we know, uh, uh, we focus on uh, uh, operating and acting locally, local autonomy. Even when we went to other cities and helped other chapters, we never tried to dictate or control those chapters. We just tried to get them what, what we had and what we thought that they could use in order to be able to run their cities. The philosophy then uh, was that those people in their cities understood the problems of their cities better than us, than we did as outsiders. So it, 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 would, it would basically derail them for us to come there and try to put our hands on their chapter and control them. But so Khaled became our first national chairman. After Khaled passed, was there somebody who was supposed to step into that role? And I mean, and it, it's a question for the people. I know the answer. It's a question the people are watching and the people wasn't there. So was there somebody who was supposed to step into that role? Was Brother E supposed to become the national chairman after Khaled? Was there somebody who was supposed to step? Was Robert Wall Williams supposed to become the national chairman? And if not, how many people thought that they, that there was their natural right to rise to that position? Well, I'm gonna say, wait, 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 before you answer, hey, I bet you didn't know they tried. Oh, you might have, we might have mentioned it. They tried to get me to be the national minister, what education or some shit at one point. You yeah. Remember that war? Yeah. And they got mad that. when I refused. Yeah, I was saying, no, nah, I don't do that shit. They got pissed off. I mean, I wanted to fight on that shit. <laughs> Why they get so yeah. mad? I, I don't know. We'll understand it better than I do. But uh, because because it was it was it was meant to be throwing. Uh, unfortunately, what I saw happening a lot after college is that people took on positions, and the reason why they took positions. And, and it wouldn't have been the case with Brother E, but for the reason why most people took national position was 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 to create a central committee of loyalty, and that loyalty was supposed was really supposed to supersede anything from the standpoint of making sure that you have a tight group of people around you based on who is the national uh, chairman uh, that would be lawless, and from that in in, in, in that way you can con have more tighter control over how things were op being operated on a, na on a national level. And now going back to your first question, uh, was, there a was there supposed to be somebody? No, there was not supposed to immediately be in someone as a chairman. What was supposed to happen from a national perspective is that you can the operation continued without a national chairman uh, in until it was, seen, it was seen fit that the regionals would come, come up and appoint a national uh, chairman again and but what had ended up happening was more or less a fight for power and uh, 
and it was primarily two people that were that were involved in feeling like they wanted they they wanted to take the, the helm right away, and that was uh, Quanell X and and um, um, uh, Malik Zulu Shabazz, and because of I would I would basically just say because of the personal power and um, and influence and ability mobility that Malik had, he basically ended up being being that national person. But um, those of us that were still operating from a uh, central committee position, whether it be regional or national, the uh, the ideology said that we were supposed to just continue operating without one and then and not rush into appointing or putting somebody in a position right away, but more, more or less let ourselves just let this work itself out over time and, 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 and give everybody the, the proper input and the proper um, positioning to see how we want to work this. And then I can automatically figure because of those disagreements of who should be in position, who should not, how it should go, that that's what created the, the splits in the different factions. Or at least that was the origin of those splits and those different factions and people stepping away and starting their own particular groups fashioned after the Panther Party and basically what we have going on now. Yes, I, let me, but let me back up a minute and say something. Anytime, especially when you're dealing with charismatic people, anytime you have a change of leadership, even if you're not talking about somebody charismatic, there's going to be people that that may have been lawless, even, even though a, a person in a position might not have necessarily attempted to create that. So leadership styles attract certain people, regardless whether we talk about this from a local level, region, or national level. And some people uh, remain and stay in, in their position or stay uh, working within the movement simply because someone that they like is at the helm of a position that they like. So anytime we had changes, there was that situation. When we merged with uh, Kwaku Duran uh, and, and formed the, the New Black Panther Party Vanguard, we had people leave. When we, when there was a uh, a separation between that and we and we merged with Khalid Muhammad, we had people leave. When Khalid died, we had a whole lot of people leave because they was following him. But it, the point I'm getting at is every time you had a change in 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 in, in power and in positions of power, you had people leave. Going back locally, when um, Aaron Michaels made me the local chairman of, of the Dallas chapter. You had people leave because Aaron wasn't the local chapter, you know, and, and him wouldn't operate on the national, I need not operate on the national level as a national minister of defense. Locally, you had a few old heads that left because I was, I became the, the local chairman. And, you, and and so every every time there's different people in positions of power, there are gonna, there are gonna be some folks that, that just feel like they're not willing to stay around because they don't have people that they trust or either they don't have people that they that that they're real tight or close to, that that may lead, and so there's there's all to me there's there's always been that that element, but yes when uh, when Khaled uh, made this transition, you we definitely had that because you had a lot of people that again were following the the uh, Khaled were following the moves he made and were just basically purely inspired to to even don a beret simply because Khaled had one. Mm. okay next question <clears throat> that we i think we need to get into so we did that background and laid that foundation and we said what the panther 48 was not the panther 48 is not another panther formation the panther 48 is not a panther chapter even though people may be active in particular panther formations we are not us three a panther chapter and we are not trying to be a panther chapter we're not recruiting people into the panther 48 we are not that that's not what we are. So what is the Panther Forty Eight? E guys ain't got shit else to do. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we I thought the Panther Forty Eight was supposed to be trying to start the the, the first Panther uh Gordon and start the Panther grocery store and start putting our rabbits and our and our tomatoes and our green beans and okra and stuff in the grocery store under the Panther label. I thought that's what it was. I think that would be a worthwhile endeavor. <laughs> I know you would like that. All right, let me let me jump in real quick. So I would say what the Panther Forty Eight is is uh, three brothers operating from a common unity and purpose, and all of us, uh, you know, being hailed from different parts of the country. Whereas I'm on the West Coast, um, Psych is 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 in, in Dallas, 
and Brother E is is, is in, in Florida, <clears throat> and us each providing our perspective on the continuity and development and continuation of, of the path of legacy, and basically us being unified in our purpose uh, in providing what we can provide. So the Panther 48, all of us again coming from the new Black Panther Party, basically uh, at this point, so early in this, in, in this development and still uh, doing what we do over the years, we definitely have the, 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 the amount of time in the movement, uh, righteous time should be in the movement, as well as knowledge and as well as just just experience to be able to come together and us three provide um, resources, whether it be knowledge, uh, uh, paperwork, just uh, you know uh, guidance for, for other of other people that that want to step into the role of of the, of the panther, or just the general public, just in terms of just basic psychology as it applies to grassroots organizing, or as it applies to just being able to avoid some of the unnecessary drama and drawbacks that people get into when when they when they attempt to try to move forward within community organizing. So I see the Panther 48 as us three brothers working to do our part just on that level. Okay, and uh, okay, I'm gonna add my two cents. And I see the Panther 48 and I'm gonna give a quick, quick background. Uh, and we've already said that we have our foundation in the, in the, in the original first Dallas chapter of the New Black Panther Party. Uh, as you know, War, but War, you uh, basically drafted me and E into the party and put us in the position under the Dallas chapter when you became the chairman, me as the chief of staff, brother E as the minister of information. Before that, I was a, I was building with War already just independently. And when I went out to Fort Worth, he connected me with two brothers, one with brother E, one was this guy, uh, his name is Third, Brother Isaiah standing right here with the gun in the background of me. These were two guys. They was in. A, they was the leaders of an organization called the New African Nationalist Movement, where I, where the primary goal of the organization was to study and understand Afrocentric thought, culture, and and basically get an understanding of the background of who we were as a people. Then that organization dissolved, and those brothers became members of the New Black Panther Party when when under war when he was chair. Uh, and, and that's essentially our background and where we started at and how we started uh, building. Now, as Panther 48, the Panther 48 uh, uh, believes deeply in the ideology of the Panther and in all of its different uh, uh, stages of its development. We believed in going and getting those ideas and that ideology and bringing those ideas together. We started this YouTube channel because it wasn't originally supposed to be a YouTube channel. We didn't even think of doing it as a YouTube channel, but we wanted to categorize that information so that the people, the youth that was coming behind us wouldn't have to keep reinventing the wheel. They wouldn't have to keep rebuilding uh, uh, something that has already been established. And one of the things that we disliked and this is a this is a thing that our our detractors don't understand because we have detractors that somehow think that we shouldn't have certain people on the show. That somehow think we should be attacking or going against certain people that claim the Panther under a certain banner. And one of the main things that brought us together and made us create the Panther Forty Eight, because we're in one hundred percent disagreement or Panthers feuding with each other. We do not agree with, believe, or support feuding with other Panther groups or other people that that, that that done that beret or that black uniform because if you agree with the way that they're doing it or not, one of the things that we understand from being people that have actually been with our boots on the ground and actually been in dangerous situations in that uniform that could have actually cost us our lives and even not a day, even not a day, the fact that we had once adorned that uniform is, is still used as something to try to try to diminish us. I had a personal problem not too long ago. And the first thing that came out was he's a black Panther. You know, that's the one thing that they try to throw at you to try to take you under. And the fact is I'm not even an active Panther now, but that always comes up. Even when I had my legal problems 20 years ago, the main thing that was brought to the courthouse was he's a black Panther. As if being a black Panther means I'm supposed to go on a plane and with a bomb strapped to me and blow something up or something. It's like, it's like, that is just the, the the worst thing that you could possibly be. You know what I'm saying? And 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 
and and and and it is it, is it, is to me those who take those chances or put themselves in harm's way like we did when we was in Jasper I, I have a high level of respect for those brothers and sisters that actually understand what they are doing and why they are doing it. Like, I've never got a check from being a Panther. I've never received my check. Are you getting our checks now, War? Because I've never got mine. You know what I'm saying? I never, I never got my, I don't I, know I, if it's supposed to it come weekly, if it's supposed to come monthly, like a Social Security check. I've never got it. You know? First of the month, motherfucker. <laughs> Checks I do have to give out, give out all the time, and, and and you and you had to get one of these checks, the psychological checks. We got <laughs> that all the time. So yeah, we we get we we don't get monetary checks, but we have to get psychological checks often. Yeah. So some the, some, some the, people more than others. Some people get daily psychological checks. You know, their mailbox is full. <laughs> so my point that I'm making is that we did not start the Panther Four Day to be a uh, to be. A, a, a platform for attacking other other activists, not even just Panthers, other activists, period. Because one of our things is we said that we primarily operate from Panther ideology, but we wanted to deal with and deal with any revolutionary group that, that brought forth a, 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 an assessment of the problem and a, a valuable solution to the problem that we face in the community, we would have them on the show. I don't care what organization they belong to as long as they were productive. Now, if you wanted to come on the show <laughs> and attack other Panther groups or attack other, other revolutionary brothers, we would not have you on the show because we don't do that. That's not what we are about. And uh, when we started the Panther Party, Age, it was E, e named it. E came up with the name. And the name has its origin in the fact that in popular culture, 48 became a number that was that was uh, that was identified with strategy or with tactics and techniques. So we took that 48 and added it to the Panther because we understand the value of Panther ideology in operating properly in a society if you use it strategically. One of the things that I can say from my personal experience is that, and and we always say it, so I'm not ashamed to say it. I went to prison. I did 17 years, and the thing that made me maneuver. That's where you that was. was yeah, that's where I was all that time. Oh shit, yeah. my bad. <laughs> I thought you was just out, you know, out of out of touch. Thought I just disappeared for a minute while y'all went yeah. through that pre-college stage. I was kind of pissed off. Like, what this <laughs> doing? I gotta have these arguments with the whole damn chapter by myself. Thanks, bro. I <laughs> yeah, I was, I was kind of out of picture. Out of the picture. But I was still doing the work. The work was still being done in a place that what that didn't have as many distractions. But when I was there, one of the things I realized, and, and I didn't plan for this, I didn't even understand that it was gonna happen. But when I was there, one of the things that I realized that I was able to maneuver the place properly because of my previous Panther training, even when dealing with the staff, when dealing with guards, and de especially when because in that situation, you have no rights. You have absolutely no rights. And for the most part, guards abuse you in prison. But because of my Panther training, I automatically knew the first thing I needed to do was get the TDCJ handbook and study those rules. I knew to do that because of the way we did with the penal code. I knew to do that. And I knew that when the guards came and they and they tried to trample over what look rights we had, I would quote those penal codes. I would quote those PD-22 codes. I would quote, I'm talking about that not only do you have uh, a handbook for your conduct, but they also have a handbook for the guards conduct. Now you don't get that. That's in the law library. So you got to go to the law library and find that. But because of that Panther training and that conditioning I went through in the Panther party, I knew to do that. And so I would quote their code to them. Their PD-22, that's what they're called in prison, PD-22 codes. I would, quote the, I would quote them to them. I would quote their administrative directors to them the things that they could and could not do. And that would freeze the average guard up because the average inmate wasn't able to do that. And then based on the things that we did in the party, organizing, creating a central committee, uh, uh, even creating a, a, a handbook and things for the, for the brothers down there to go by, my panther training gave me that ability. And that's what helped me to maneuver through. So that leads back to what I, leaves credits, uh, or credit back to what I just said that Panther ideology, when properly used as a strategy, is beneficial in helping a, a person maneuver through life. 
maneuver through reality. Hell, even when I got out, that that training and that conditioning helped me to go to the job that I was at and actually create an operation manual. I call it a smart book, just like kind of, not just like the one we created, but under the format of the one we created. And that blew those white folks' minds. They were like, "Oh my God, what is this?" You know, I mean, that, but that was all part of the training and the conditioning. If you were paying attention to what, when you was active in the party, that I was able to utilize to further my career. But that's what the to me what the Panther Forty Eight uh, is and, and the purpose of it is for that continuity to pass that knowledge down and so that people wouldn't be continuously re reinventing the wheel and when we decided to create a YouTube channel it was to basically solidify that information so that people even if they didn't know us even if they didn't know who to call they could just jump on the Panther 48 YouTube channel look through the different videos and say okay boom brother building on this this is where I can get this information from and that's what, what we were trying to do that was our whole purpose of creating the Panther 48 E you want to build on that I guess not oh well, there you go well and do this because you might cut this out <laughs> so I heard you reference uh the party and, and uh you know the studies and whatnot and let's face it Let's face it, Panther 48 has existed since way back then. Because even when we was having debates and conversations and whatnot, essentially it boiled down to the entire chapter versus the three of us. War was always the politician ass motherfucker over there trying to keep balance and keep his minions and all this shit where they needed to be. And, and we were essentially the, the new cats on the block, the troublemakers, trouble, troublemakers that could nobody out argue or out reference, you know, we took took the party to court one time in, in, in that bookstore. That was bad fun. I love that. Yeah. That was delicious. Yes, it um, was. <laughs> so <laughs> all of that to uh, uh, say, okay, so those are the things that help shape, shape your mind and prepare you for survival in the, in the penitentiary. That's where you say you were. I don't know. Well, did you know anything about that? Because I ain't heard nothing about that penitentiary shit. It's news to me. <laughs> but my question is, if that's what prepared you for being in there, what part prepared you for life after that? What do you mean? Life after prison? Yeah. Well, when I was in prison, the, uh, the thing about prison is when I was in prison, I already knew that you know, most people in prison, a lot of people in prison are sitting in prison like they're on vacation. And so they're, what they're doing is they're watching, this is what your people are doing down there. They're watching the stories, the soap operas, like like women on welfare do. They're sitting around watching soap opera. They're watching sports all day. they masturbating in the shower. They're playing dominoes all day long. they gambling all day and they're sleeping. That's what the average dude is doing in prison. It's my That's my Sunday it. afternoon. No, I'm tripping. <laughs> That's it. So, so whatever idea people got of you go to prison, you become Malcolm X and you walking with a brother named Bimbi that's teaching you and this and that, that's not really what's, that's not the majority of what's happening in prison. A lot of dudes think they're on vacation. Me, when I went to prison, I was upset. I was aggravated about <laughs> my, my fall. Yes, I was upset and I was disappointed in myself. And because of that anger and that, that, that frustration, I, I automatically knew that I had to go through a process of rebuilding myself and refining myself. All the studying that we had done, building, all the activity that we had done, now I had to sit down and mentally comb through it all and start refining myself to try to chop off a lot of the unnecessary fat that I had on me that needed to go and, and, and restructure and build myself and fortify myself to be a more uh, 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 productive revolutionary type brother. Now, one of the things I told myself, because when I first got incarcerated, I didn't know how long I was going to be gone because I had four charges. I got convicted of two of them and was sentenced to two counts of 20 years aggravated. And I still had to come back on bench warrant to go face the other two, which could have gave me a life sentence. So I didn't know how long I was going to be gone. So, But I still wanted to be able to leave something that was beneficial. So I started studying people like Mumia Abu-Jamal, uh, Malcolm X, when, 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 uh, Nelson Mandela, people that did time and still was able to have a, a, some level of influence. So my goal, basically get to the point, my goal became 
to start building on manhood. That's what I wanted to build on. My goal, I looked around me and I saw a lot of young brothers who were sitting in prison that had never been around me and never been around their fathers and never had proper manhood direction. So I started structuring basically something that we always talked about out here that we never got around to fully developing. I started structuring a manhood training course. I named it the Uhuru Shule under the, under the term that, that uh, you had already fell in love with, meaning uh, Swahili term that means liberation school. Cause to me and my thinking that proper knowledge liberated a man. The thing that kept a man enslaved was ignorance. That's what kept him limited. That's what kept him bounded. That's the only thing that really limits us to me in my, in my opinion. So proper knowledge is the main thing that would liberate a man. So in liberation school, man would get the knowledge that would liberate him from being a boy or a childish male to becoming a true man. And so I developed that class and in developing it and teaching it to other people, it helped me develop my own level of manhood because there's no way that you can, you can teach this without learning it. There's no way possible. The more I taught it, the more I learned it, and the more I had to walk my walk and went while I was talking my talk. Along with that training, with the philosophical things that came along with being a man, was the physical training that I started putting a lot of those young brothers through. And, and so we started doing a, a training set, physical training session, physical training, uh, uh, hand-to-hand combat training, all of that. And those are the things that prepared me when I walked out of prison to, to operate under a disciplined lifestyle once I touched ground, <clears throat> once I once I walked out of prison and I got back free. Again, I knew that instantly I needed to come home and start rebuilding myself on a financial level. I, I knew instantly I needed to come home and, and be as productive as I possibly could be. Uh, I haven't always succeeded in that because one of the things that I've learned and a great lesson that I've received recently is that sometimes you got to understand who you can't help. It's an old quote from, uh, I think it's from Confucius, where he says that to refuse to teach those who can be taught is, is, uh, is selfish. And to try to teach those who can't be taught is arrogance. And so I have to learn how to de- make that definition between the two. Did that answer your question? Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Now, okay, we got another one that we need to touch on because, again, we keep getting attacked for the people that we've had on our platform. We get attacked a lot for that, you know, for the people. And we had one dude in the comments, and I should have printed him out so I could have read him. We had one dude in, the, in our comments, he said that, uh, well, one brother said, I don't know why the Daruba interview didn't get as many views. You know, they felt like brothers should have came out for the Daruba interview because it was a very powerful interview and it was inspiring to me. You know, I didn't even do too much talking during that interview. I just let that brother talk and listen. But we had one cat come out and say, yeah, I'm surprised that the elder even came on the show and dealt with them. You know, all the all the people that they didn't had on and the stuff that they about, you know, and, and, and that person would have to describe what they meant by that. But evidently, because of the people that we've had on the show previously, uh, to that person, we are we're denigrated. To that particular person, we're we shouldn't be seen as as serious people anymore because of the people we had on our on our show previously. So what I want to ask is, do we support or agree with everyone that we have interviewed on our show? Yes. And no, <laughs> hell no, we don't. <laughs> no, no, that's that that no. was that, that's never the intent but let, let me let me say this to clear this up just so uh in case obviously people may not know um i've had i've known the uh, uh way early on back in the days of of organizing under the uh the new black panther party with aaron aaron and deruba were, were were close um deruba was one of the people that aaron actually um got a lot of counsel from in terms of establishing the new Black Panther Party or, uh, uh, back in the days and, and, and got guidance from him, myself as well. And, it, and and at one point in time, I lived in Atlanta. And when I lived in Atlanta, I would um, chop it up with Daruba and, and Brother Kalanji with, with FTP. At one point in time, I was getting ready to establish a, a chapter of, of, of FTP uh, and, and help with that. That organization spread it nationally as well. Uh, but I remained... Um, under the banner of the, of the new Black Panther Party at the time, that I felt like I couldn't wear two hats. So, 
uh, Daruba being on our show is basically a direct result of our relationship with Daruba and Daruba respecting the uh, camaraderie and in, in, in the work that we've done. Um, so I, I think what, what 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 happens and what is potentially happening as a result of our humble humbleness, you know, is that people underestimate really, and, and this is not me tooting my horn, but underestimate the power, uh, especially from a knowledge base and experience base that Panther 48 has between between us three, because we have never been the kind of people that are, that are based on ego or based on, again, not, not our whole thing is not to be charismatic. Our whole thing is not, despite what brother you think, to get pe- get minions under us. The deal is, is we um, are genuine and have always been genuine about doing the work. And we we are alive to this day and, and able to still operate without being psychologically destroyed as a result of growing as as a panther. And I think that's one of the biggest things that that um, that I will I definitely want to make, make sure it's a takeaway from this is that when a person decides to to jump into being a panther, especially if you operating uh, from behind the helm of, of of leadership that don't necessarily know what the hell they're doing. To the degree that it creates a whole lot of dysfunctionality within the, within the organization, uh, there's been a lot of people that have been damaged as a result of being Panthers. Uh, because for one, you you may come into a certain level of knowledge, and then I like to use the same example that 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 I try to get people to recognize by law enforcement. When your job is to deal with with the downtrodden every day, your job is to always see the worst in people, or your job is to always be the one that they call for help you get inundated and used to seeing poverty oppression and 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 struggle and strife those kind of environments can have psychological uh, uh implications upon a person it is a lot to take on and i think people take for granted what what uh what make what makes up the average life of somebody that that really is truly caring Warren at Beret and being and being righteous about that, uh, about just the level of responsibility that goes into Warren at Beret. And again, if, if you're not strong and in, in the right headspace at all times, uh, uh, the wrong decision can can wind you up in jail or, or in, you know, in jail or dead or or could, or, or could cause someone else to be in jail or dead. Cause, so we have people's lives in our hands all the time, especially from a leadership standpoint. So you have to be real careful. And so I think people can take that for granted. And a lot of that taken for granted simply has to do with the level of standards that has demised over the years in terms of what it means to be a panther. Unfortunately, not all formations and not all chapters within all formations have a a, a actual concrete training program that is required just for you to be able to work as a panther. Uh, And so from those standards, uh, a lot of the a lot of the things have, uh, have went down and devolved in terms of, of, of Panthers, what it takes to be a Panther. So you may not necessarily have people that are shell shot. It's been plenty of conversations over the years that I continue to have with a lot of elders from the the, the uh, third generation, uh, the third development of Panthers that will talk to me from that position and ask me, hey, brother, you all right? And I know that they're not just you know, giving me the, the the basic meet and greet talk, they're they're saying it from just the standpoint of knowing what they've been through and and knowing what we what the organization represents and truly represents that it, it is it is something dangerous, and uh, too too often I think some of the younger generations take that for granted, and this is what get a lot of the old heads upset is that they see that the 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 real work that's supposed to be being put in by Panthers are taken for granted by some of the younger generations because they have not really truly earned that that to be able to don that beret but yet it's still able to work and 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 the, in those level of frustrations and those levels of lack of growth are some of the things that you definitely have to uh, uh, watch out for and let me make real, one real quick, quick correction since we are dealing with histor- historical significance. Um, Brother, uh, uh, what, what, the, brother Third was never actually under my uh, my leadership at any point in time. Brother Third was actually under Adela Brooks, who was the, the, the chairman of the Fort Fort Work chapter. So I, I did want to put that out there for one, let people know back in the day before another uh, pre, a pre college we had a, we had uh, 
a, a woman, a powerful woman by the name of Della Brooks, that was a chair of the uh, of the Fort Worth chapter. And uh, Brother Third used to we used to rock with them. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, 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 I had somebody to say you threw me out when you said that one. I was gonna add to that. I can't remember. Uh, that's Brother Third right there. That's Brother Third holding the uh, SKS right there. But uh, <clears throat> is that like the only time he in hell one? Huh? Ain't that like one of the only times he in hell one? Okay. Yeah, he, I think he had that boy a few times. But uh, <laughs> I, now, what do we think, Panther Forty Eight opinion? What do we think is the most effective means to be involved in the growth of Panther continuity? Let me jump in, and then I give you something to work with. Hint. Okay, yeah. Hint. Well, to me, I would say this because uh, I am uh, currently still a, 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 happen to be a chairman in the San Diego of the San Diego Black Panther Party. Uh, to me, it has to do with basically teaching the next generation, uh, specifically gearing them through the process of repair on as it applies to what we call the tri-factor, the individual, the family, and, and, and the community, and to be able to organize at a level of what I call to be functional Panthers. One of the biggest things that we uh, used to break down, and in fact, I can, another part of history, I guess it's important that we say the majority of the, the membership manual and the documents that were being used in Dallas came from us three. That kind of goes right back to what was stated earlier about we were the Panther 48 even before we were the Panther 48. So a lot of the, basically our camaraderie comes through the fact that we were always intellectuals and we was always about document, document and always about, about training. And so when I think about what the growth of the, uh, the in terms of Panther continuity, it's basically preparing the next generation of people that want to dawn that beret and giving them giving them some some type of guidance and giving them something that they can have that that is concrete in terms of what how do I operate within this and, and as well as setting guidelines and setting standards that may not necessarily be in place or, or readily available when you operate and deal with other other formations across the nation. So Although, like we stated, the Panther 48 is not a, a, a chapter or a formation of the Black Panthers, we are a, uh, a force to be reckoned with as it applies to having access to the proper information and the proper mentality, the proper legacy and the proper direction to go if you want to call yourself a Panther. It's like we a force, goddammit. <laughs> yeah. Fuck me. <laughs> And you know, uh, kind of to add to that, you know, I've I always say this a lot, and I didn't make it up, and and those who know will know, but I always believe the positive education always corrects errors. I always believe in that, and which which is the peace acronym. Positive education always corrects errors. So when the people get the proper education, then whatever errors they was operating off of will start to be corrected, and that's the same thing I think has happened to the party. You know, when I came home, I was surprised to see all these different factions and see all these different splits. I was surprised, I didn't understand that. And you know, one of the things that when I first came into the chapter, when I came into the party, I think I was maybe 17, 18 when I first met War. And uh, I think I may have been 21 when I started being uh, active in, in a revolutionary activity and, uh, and started studying and started learning these things. But one of the things that really truly attracted me to the party was the, the unity. And, the, and, and the, 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 uh, the unity that the party had, but then we were small. We didn't have as many chapters. We didn't have, as like he said a little bit earlier, the bigger it got, the, the more branches and chapters we got, the more problems occurred. But see, I came from a gang culture and, and being a part of those street tribes, there was division and war with each other based on just what set you was from or what part of town you was from. And originally I didn't see that in the party. That didn't exist in the party. And that was something that I loved. That whole concept of black unity was 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 an extraordinary thing to me. I remember. I don't even know if you remember this, E, but uh, <clears throat> I I remember when I first had my first son, when he was first born, and you was asking me questions like, you know, you got you got milk, you got Similac, you got the things you need, you got some diapers, and and I got a little frustrated. Like, why the hell do you keep asking me questions, personal questions about my family? I mean, what what the hell is that? You know, and I said something to the degree of, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly how I said it, but I said something to the degree of niggas. Man, niggas don't ask stuff like that. 
and you and you say, well, that's the problem, brother. You you fail to realize that you're not dealing with niggas anymore, and I, and that that was a, a statement that stood with me over 20 years because there there was a there was a paradigm shift that that occurred. I said to myself, damn, I'm not dealing with niggas anymore. Cause when you're dealing with niggas, you when they ask no kind type of question, they're digging for something. They're trying to they're trying to find their line in. But this was concerned brothers who looked out for each other and who was concerned about to make sure that their other brothers were doing well. And you know that's one of the things that I loved about the party. You know, we would do the work, we would go marching through Jasper, we would do those things, but we also did other things. There were simple things just sitting in front of the headquarters and just chopping it up and building back and forth with each other, organ concepts and ideas or when we went on our uh, biff whack, where we went and did our did our training and 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 come and that camaraderie that we got from just building and chopping it up with each other. Those things was extremely important. The 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 influence that our association had on our children. You know what I'm saying? When we took all our children out to Paris and had them standing on the corner selling buttons and selling shirts and things of this nature, that camaraderie camaraderie was a powerful thing to me for 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 us and for our children. And so when when, when I see these people want to beef with each other over being a Panther, to me that's 100% counterproductive to what a Panther is and what a Panther stands for. Yeah, War tricked me with that camaraderie bullshit too. <laughs> he got me All on right. that shit too. All right, what are your, what are your, in y'all's opinion, of some identifying markers of Panther D evolution? Or backwards operation. What I think about that is what, the, what the, one of the markers is is not holding the local chapter accountable for local works. I think that one of the biggest things that I that I saw in terms of the demise of where I saw the direction of the New Black Panther Party going. Uh, uh, to further further explain that, when I saw chapters basically waiting on national orders to go across the country and stand with guns, then I felt I realized something was wrong. Uh, basically, you had. In, in all in, in one of the one of the biggest things that I continually uh, critiqued and had issue with in regards to the, the way the, the black power manual was written uh, it, again it extracted from what we did locally but there was a lot of things that were seasoned and, and sprinkled in there that, that we didn't agree with is that it constantly kept saying call national headquarters call national headquarters call national headquarters and I felt like it gave local uh, chapters too much leeway in terms of not being able to think for themselves. And, and and it did not hold them accountable for being able to think for themselves. And so as a result, a, a lot of chapters, um, and I would just say people, not so much chapters, but people relied too much into too heavily upon being inspired, like I stated earlier, and waiting for to be told what to do. And as a result of that, a lot of a, a lot of a, a chapters were basically being made mandatory, and, and that was the key word to me: made mandatory that they had to travel to this place to be in front of the camera to uh, to protest or, or, or to show up with guns at this location, or they had to be over here, they had to be over there. But you literally had very little work in some areas being done locally to try to impact to, to create situations that would actually impact and improve the lives and. It, in, in the works of what's going on in that local city, but yet they was always seen in in in, 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 a, in another place that's outside of their city where they can't be held accountable for whatever they whatever they're going and dealing with. And so when you start having chapters whose primary thing was to was to travel to travel here and to travel there, and, and individuals who would basically be uh, get jumping on phone calls and, and trying to and raising money from other chapters so that they can go somewhere outside of their, their their local jurisdiction, then I felt like, no, this is not the direction that the party should be heading in. It is not the goal of a, of a local chapter to raise money for individuals to travel across the country to protest or represent, so to speak, and, and to speak on things. What's supposed to happen as is, is that the local chapters do the work of the local chapters, and then those local chapters help uh, identify and grow with regional chapters or regional uh, uh, committees and then they work and develop through the national but there was so much lord so so much work being done based upon law being loyal and from that when I say loyal from that standpoint I mean the word certain things would not be uh, 
challenge simply because somebody gave you a position. Somebody gave you a position, and because it's the person that gave you that position, you wouldn't question some of the logic in terms of the things that that would be that was being said. And and so when I say loyalty, I mean blind loyalty. I mean to the point to where you know this this could be done a better way, or you know we could be more effective doing this that way, or we could be more effective if we if it didn't approach that particular thing, but then address something else that we need to be dealing with locally. But because somebody gave them that position, then basically what happened is they would not, they would keep their mouth mouth closed and wouldn't say anything and, and allow certain levels of, of to me, pound the dysfunctionality continue to move forward. And so that's when I saw that demise taking place. Well, let me say this, and then uh, we can we can segue to one more question before we get ready to shut down. But uh, you know, I'm gonna go back to the to the to the continuity question we asked. What were some of the things uh, that we believe? What do we think are, are the most effective means of, of bringing that continuity? And I said that proper education always corrects errors, and and there are certain things that I think has to be focused on as being a panther. You know, I used to always say back back in the day that the Panther Party had a two-way relationship. It had a relationship with the members of the organization and it had a relationship with the community. And when we understand the power of that relationship, for example, uh, I had a friend that did 24 years in prison and he went and got his CDL, but then he couldn't get a truck driving job because he didn't have on-road experience. However, I had a Panther brother that drove trucks. So I called my Panther brother that drove trucks and told him the situation. And he took that brother on, didn't even know him, but he took that brother on, gave him his over the road experience. And that, that allowed that brother to break into the truck driving industry. And that's that, that, that internal relationship that the Panther party has. The Panther party needs to operate as a fraternity amongst the members where we build and uplift each other. Whatever I don't know, brother E knows it. So therefore I know it, whatever, whatever, uh, uh, War don't have, I have it, so therefore Brother War has it. That's the way that that should operate internally. And then I believe that that some of the things that need to be focused on is a functional definition and understanding of politics, like we did our series on the functional definition of politics, a functional definition and understanding of economics, and a functional definition and understanding of our training for families, because a lot of, a lot of times, what we are dealing with is a lot of dysfunctional families. And we got to understand that this sick, demented society targeted those families and made them intentionally dysfunctional because the families were the first incubator of the people. And when the people are coming out of these, these dysfunctional incub incubators, then, then you're going to have a dysfunctional community. So to me, those are the things that we need to focus on and, 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 and revolutionaries truly need to be targeting. Now I'm gonna say, I'm gonna ask this one question and then we're gonna get ready to shut out, shut down for the night. Uh, what role in our, in, your, in our perception, in our opinions, what role does economics play in approaching a solution through, through financial means for individuals? What role does economics play in our, uh, in our desire to be free and our desire to liberate the community? Of course, economics are extremely important But unfortunately, we have no concept. And I mean, even entrepreneurs and people who seemingly have an idea of how to, to make money don't really understand what's going on in terms of money. We don't, we don't understand that just because we have a pot full of money, that that doesn't really mean shit. Simply because, you know, in my lifetime, the dollar has literally lost some 90, 90 some odd, 92% of its purchasing power, which means I have to work 92% or 92 times harder to get the things that I need, just the basics than we did when I was born. We think that because we pile up a bunch of cash in the bank, that that somehow means that we've made it to a certain level or whatnot, and we don't understand that it's not the amount of money that you have, it's what you can do with that money. And over the course of time, what it is you can do with that money has fallen, 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 and will continue to fall. And it's understanding that if you really get that concept, global, 
news, global current events, things that are happening on a global level become that much more important. The reason that the dollar that we, this country, have been able to afford cheap shit and live a life that is not third world, that is comparatively wealthy. We are rich in some nations. If we took our money to other countries, we've considered very, very well off. And I don't mean the Kardashians, I mean the three of us. Uh, and the reason that the U.S. has been able to maintain that is because the U.S. has been the world reserve currency for since, since the 70s. You know, and as that comes to an end, as we see different countries positioning themselves to remove the U.S. from its hegemonic, its top dog, uh, most powerful military economy, uh, blah, 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 to take the U.S. out of that position, things will continue to get uh, worse and worse. And we have to understand that. You know, I, I can't even say that, you know, I've been the, 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 the one that, that had the prepper flag waving over the house. But I can't even say that I'm a prepper at this point because prepping is something that you do. It's a lifestyle. It's not even just something you do. It's a lifestyle that you take on in preparing for something that's going to happen down the road. The reality of it is if we understood economics. It's been happening. It's already been going on. The U.S. dollar has been on its way out for quite some time. And things will, why, why are so many shelves empty at Walmart? Every time I go to Walmart, which I haven't been a lot, but I've been making trips past two or three weeks, I'm taking pictures of the shelves because there's less and less food on the shelves. Uh, 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 and not understanding what the role that global politics plays and what you can get to eat, uh, how much you have to spend, all of these things are already taking place, whether it's the war in Ukraine, or the Nord Stream blowing up, uh, OPEC cutting back its oil production. Yes, your gas is about to jump up again. Uh, 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 heating costs are going to skyrocket in, in the wintertime. All of these things are coming to the U.S. And not understanding how economics is supposed to work puts us in a position where we're constantly reaching for, for money, trying to get money, trying to make money, as opposed to focusing ourselves on getting those things uh, that money is supposed to provide. It's not that we want money. Is that we want shoes. It's not that we want money. It's that we want a need gas. It's not that we want money. Money is just a, it's not even real. It's fiat, it's fake. It's not backed by anything. So as the U.S. Go, loses it, continues to lose its position globally as an economic power, all of these things will become more and more important to, uh, along with the, the, the idea of, 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 of uh, central bank back uh, uh, digital currencies and, and, and that begins to, to, to or continues to roll out and they roll it out in this country, the next you know pandemic or whatever climate shutdown that they've already started to creep in comes into play. And you know just, just understanding what economics actually is and how to manipulate the game to really manipulate the game. You know there's going to come a point in time where people are going to be uh, more influenced by the fact that you've got uh, a, a dozen eggs. You know, what can I give you to get those eggs? Damn the dollars. I don't have any dollars. What can I trade you to get some eggs to feed my family? And this is not some crazy conspiracy. This is happening in other countries. Not third world, you know, you know babies in Africa with the flies around their mouth, all that bullshit. Not in those countries, in this country, in countries like this, is beginning to happen. And we don't, we still continue to be enslaved by economics because we would, or using economics because we don't understand what economics is. If you want to live the good life, you need to figure out, you know, I hate that, that fucking saying, living my best life. What the fuck does that even mean? You know, I'm living my best life because I've learned how to build shit, how to cook shit, how to make shit. I haven't bought juice in months because I figured out I can make my own juice in an economic way. And so I'm able to cut out the middleman. That's less money I got to spend. I can make stretch that out and last it for a while. So I'm living my best life because I'm growing and I'm evolving. I'm not uh, uh, putting that Novocaine that Malcolm talked about uh, on my jaw so I can suffer peacefully because I have some sense of understanding of what economics is. Money is on its way out. Fuck your dollar bills. Fuck your ducats, your bread, your cash, your dough, your scrilly, your coins, whatever the fuck it is y'all calling it these days. It don't matter because it, it, it's all going away. But but understanding the game makes us more effective. We had we were in a position. I think you were gone 
where we were working to put together a situation where sisters and brothers would come on Thursday to the community education classes, get some type of ticket that they could come back on Saturday morning and exchange that ticket for, we had uh, started to a relationship with some, some farmers in the area. where We were gonna be able to get you know, a, a certain amount of, of food. So we were gonna make food bags. You come back with that ticket on Saturday morning, you exchange that ticket for some food. That's fucking economics. Cash ain't economics. Money ain't economics. It's just money. But being a taking what you have and making it address what it is you need, putting those things together, that's economics. And that's what we were doing. You know, didn't get to follow through because you know, all this other crap that was going on happened. The situations like that, where we're stepping outside of it because we understand what economics is supposed to do. And that's what we don't get. We don't understand what economics is supposed to provide. Money makes it so that you can get your red bottom shoes. Economics makes it so that you can feed your family. And that's the difference. And that's something we've got to, to get into our thick ass skulls at this point and stop playing little Wayne games. Like money makes you somebody. I always have to dig it a little Wayne because I just can't stand that motherfucker. <laughs>